Yesterday, Google released a tech report on the much-anticipated Gemini family of models. Gemini comes in three delightful flavors, Ultra, Pro, and Nano. Among other findings, the report says that Gemini Ultra is the first model to achieve human expert performance on the well-studied exam benchmark, MMLU. In this video, I'll summarize key results from the paper. To give a qualitative sense of the cross-modal reasoning of the Ultra model, let's look at this example. The model is prompted with, here's a solution to a physics problem by a student. A skier slides down the frictionless slope as shown. What is the skier's speed at the bottom? Then we have a delightful sketch drawing, and the student giving it a brave try using the conservation of energy. The prompt then asks Gemini, did the student get the correct answer? If the solution is wrong, please explain what is wrong and solve the problem. Now, there is a problem here. When the student calculates potential energy, they use the length rather than the height of the slope. Gemini spots that the student did not get the correct answer. It explains why, and then fixes the answer with nice formatting. Okay, let's jump to model architecture. Gemini builds on transformer decoders and is trained to support a 32K context length. The Ultra model is the most capable and is apparently efficiently servable at scale on TPU accelerators. It would be interesting to know what this means in terms of cost. The Pro model is optimized for cost as well as latency. Then the Nano model is designed to run on device and has two versions. Nano 1 with 1.8 billion parameters for low memory devices and Nano 2 with 3.25 billion parameters targeting high memory devices. These are trained by distilling from larger Gemini models and are 4-bit quantized for deployment. The Gemini architecture allows input sequences of text, audio, images and videos and produces responses of text interleaved with images. Interestingly, for the Pro model, they are able to complete pre-training in a matter of weeks, which uses a fraction of the Ultra's resources. Let's go to training infrastructure, which uses TPU V5E and TPU V4 chips. Here's what a TPU V5E chip looks like. A single tensor core with four matrix multiply units. The chip specifications are optimized for efficiency, hence the little e. This is what a TPU V4 chip looks like with two tensor cores. One potential rationale for the heavy focus on efficiency relative to overall performance is described on the semi-analysis substack. The TPU V5 and the smaller sibling TPU V5e are clearly not designed for peak performance at the cost of everything else. They are both significantly lower power, memory bandwidth and flops than Nvidia's H100. Google, due to designing and acquiring their own chips through Broadcom, pays significantly lower margins for them. As such, power consumption, networking cost, system cost, and deployment flexibility are much larger indicators of the total cost of ownership for the chip over the course of four or more years. This is quite different from Nvidia's business model, where the total cost of ownership equation is dominated by capex. So it makes sense to squeeze out way more performance. Jumping back to Gemini, we see that training Gemini Ultra used a large fleet of TPU V4 accelerators across multiple data centers. Genuine machine failures are commonplace across all hardware accelerators at such large scales, due to external factors such as cosmic rays. Here they cite this interesting paper, which shows that neutrons can cause all kinds of havoc in computing chips. The TPU V4 accelerators are deployed in superpods of 4096 chips, each connected to a dedicated optical switch. At Gemini Ultra scale, they combine superpods in multiple data centers using Google's intracluster and intercluster network. That sounds like it would be pretty challenging to do efficiently. But they say that network latencies and bandwidths are sufficient to support the commonly used synchronous training paradigm with model parallelism within superpods and data parallelism across superpods. The stack is built on the now familiar technologies of JAX, Pathways, GSPMD partitioning, and the XLA compiler. To avoid the overhead of checkpointing to disk, they use redundant in-memory copies of the model state so that on any unplanned hardware failures, they can rapidly recover directly from an intact model replica. This increased the overall good put which they define as the time spent computing useful new steps over the elapsed time of the training job, from 85% with Palm 2 to 97% for Gemini. 
They highlight the particular issue of silent data corruption, which happens every week or two given the scale of Gemini. These problems are described in detail in Silent Data Corruptions at Scale from Facebook. Here the authors say, it is our observation that computations are not always accurate. In some cases, the CPU can perform computations incorrectly. For example, when you perform 2 times 3, the CPU may give a result of 5 instead of 6, silently under certain microarchitectural conditions, without an indication of the miscomputation in system event or error logs. Scary. Silent data corruptions are not limited to soft errors due to radiation and environmental effects with probabilistic models, like those cosmic rays we met earlier. Instead, silent data corruptions can occur due to device characteristics and are repeatable at scale. With Gemini, the authors say that rapidly detecting and removing faulty hardware required several new techniques that exploit deterministic replay to isolate incorrect computations. They say that their fully deterministic infrastructure allowed them to quickly identify root causes, and this was a crucial ingredient towards stable training. One can imagine the significant engineering effort required to get fully deterministic replay at this scale. All of the random seeds. Let's now go to training dataset. We learn that the dataset is both multimodal and multilingual. They use the sentence piece tokenizer, where they find that training the tokenizer on a large sample of the entire training corpus improves the inferred vocabulary and subsequently improves model performance. The dataset sizes were based on the chinchilla scaling laws, while smaller models are trained for significantly more tokens to improve performance for a given inference budget, as suggested by Lama. A lot of filters are applied to the datasets. Here the authors confirm the community consensus that data quality is critical to a highly performing model. OK, now for evaluation, starting with academic benchmarks. We've got MMLU with multiple choice questions in 57 subjects, GSM8K for grade school math, the math benchmark, big bench hard, human eval for Python coding tasks, natural to code, drop, hella swag, and WMT23 for machine translation. The high level takeaway is that Gemini Ultra is the first model that is comparable to GPT-4 across these benchmarks. In most cases, they are pretty well matched. On the standard 5-shot MMLU evaluation, GPT-4 is better with 86.4% versus 837 for Gemini Ultra. If you use a new prompting scheme proposed in this work called Uncertainty Routed Chain of Thought, where the model produces k chain of thought samples, selects the majority vote if the model is confident above a threshold, and otherwise defers to the greedy sample choice, then Gemini Ultra does a little better. That's highlighted here where the uncertainty routed strategy appears to benefit Gemini Ultra, shown in blue, more than it benefits GPT-4, shown in grey. Hacker News is not happy with this table. Twas ever thus. Palmick writes, the table is highly misleading. It uses different methodologies all over the place. Also, it uses different metrics for Ultra and Pro, making them hard to compare. I believe this is referring to the fact that Gemini Pro here is evaluated with 8 samples, while Gemini Ultra is evaluated with 32. One benchmark that may be particularly useful is Natural to Code for Python code generation. That's a new held-out set with no leakage on the web. Here, Gemini Ultra is one percentage point ahead of GPT-4. To get a sense of the relative abilities of the various Gemini family members versus the Pro model, which is normalised here to have a score of 1, we can see from this plot that Gemini Ultra provides the biggest gains on math and science, and the smallest gains on factuality. The smaller nano models lose the most ground on summarisation. When it comes to long context, it appears that Gemini models can indeed make use of the full context. A synthetic retrieval test is run, that places key value pairs at the beginning of the context, then adds in long filler text, then asks the model for the value associated with a particular key. Here it is found that the Ultra model retrieves the correct value with 98% accuracy when queried across the full context length. This graph also shows that as you increase the context size all the way up to 32,000 tokens, the model gets better and better at predicting the next token reflected here in the lower negative log likelihood loss, suggesting that the longer context is useful. Some human preference evaluations show that Gemini Pro is preferred to Palm 2 on creativity, instruction following, and safety. As a demonstration of complex reasoning, 
Gemini Pro is used as a basis for a specialized coding model called AlphaCode 2. In a separate report, researchers find that when evaluated on the CodeForces platform, AlphaCode reaches somewhere around the 85th percentile on average. Now we come to multimodal results. Gemini Ultra is pretty strong, outperforming the previous state of the art across each of the benchmarks shown here. On the recent MMMU benchmark, for example, comparing Gemini Ultra with GPT-4V when they both use the PassAt1 metric, we see a few points of aggregate improvement, though the performance differences are somewhat subject specific. Here's a qualitative example of the model in action. It is given a set of four plots, asked to explain what these plots are, then provide code that rearranges them, which it is able to do mostly successfully. There's a minor bug in that the y-axis has changed from here to here, but overall it's pretty solid. On video understanding, Gemini represents a fairly clear step up from Flamingo on benchmarks like Vatex, Ucook2, and NextQA. When it comes to image generation, we learn that Gemini is able to output images natively without having to rely on an intermediate natural language description that can bottleneck the model's ability to express images. Given the prompt, give me two ideas that I could do with these two colors, together with some multimodal content that includes some green and pink yarn. The model responds with I see green and pink yarn, followed by the idea, how about a green avocado with pink seed, shown here, or a green bunny with pink ears, adorable. For audio understanding, the high level takeaway is that Gemini Pro is pretty strong relative to Whisper and the universal speech model. That's across automatic speech recognition benchmarks, like multilingual LibriSpeech, and automatic speech translation, like Covost 2. From a practical perspective, Nano 1 is also pretty strong here. That will presumably be useful for on-device ASR. There's an interesting demo for modality combination, where the model is prompted with input images and input audio. Given this image and the audio, what's the first step to make a veggie omelette with these ingredients? The model outputs text saying, crack the eggs into a bowl and whisk them. Now the user clearly took those instructions and ran with them a little, and responds with this image and speech which says, thank you for the instructions. I started making my omelette. Does it look ready now? I'd like to pause here to commend the user for courageously trusting the model to assess whether or not eggs are properly cooked. Gemini says, it looks like it's almost ready. You can flip it over to cook the other side. The user asks, why is it not ready? And like a master chef, the model responds, it's not ready because the eggs are still runny. Finally, the user provides another image and asks, what about now? Gemini responds with, it looks ready now. You can take it off the heat and serve it. Last, we have responsible deployment. Here, the team used model impact assessments to cover areas like factuality, child safety, harmful content, cybersecurity, bio-risk, representation, and inclusivity. A set of model policies are developed to steer model development and evaluations and serve as an indication of launch readiness. The evaluations include assurance evaluations for governance and review by a group outside of the model development team. Only high-level insights are fed back into the training process to assist with mitigation efforts. The evaluations include ongoing testing for dangerous capabilities such as potential biohazards, persuasion, and cybersecurity. In addition, external evaluations are conducted by partners outside of Google to identify blind spots. When it comes to instruction tuning, in order to mitigate risks of harmful text generation, the authors generate a dataset of potential harm-inducing queries across approximately 20 harm types. They then use an approach based on a custom data generation recipe loosely inspired from constitutional AI, where they inject variants of Google's content policy language as constitutions. For factuality, there was a focus on three key desired behaviors, attribution, closed book response generation, where the goal is that Gemini should not hallucinate incorrect information in the context of a fact-seeking prompt, and hedging, where if prompted with an input such that it is unanswerable, Gemini should not hallucinate. Rather, it should acknowledge that it cannot provide a response by hedging. On benchmarks to test these abilities, it is found that instruction tuning helps with reducing factual inaccuracy, improves attribution, and improves hedging. To wrap things up and conclude, Gemini is a strong model and appears to represent the first viable competitor to GPT-4. As we saw earlier, 
The authors highlight that Gemini Ultra surpasses human expert performance on the exam benchmark MMLU, scoring 90%, though it's worth noting that this was achieved by changing the prompting strategy. Gemini Pro has been rolled out as part of BARD, and there is a definite change in vibe. I asked, are you based on Gemini? It responds, lol, got that wrong earlier today. BARD is on Gemini Pro in English across most of the world as of December 6th, 2023. That's it, we've reached the end. I hope you have a wonderful day.